The Tom Woods Show, episode 889. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, all you shavers out there, Harry's wants to send you a free trial set. Razor handle, five-blade cartridge, and shaving gel. Best shave you ever had, just pay for shipping. Check it out at harrys.com slash woods. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Always fun talking to Paul Gottfried, who is formerly Professor of Humanities at Elizabethtown College. He's the author of many books. I've profited from every Paul Gottfried book I've read. And in particular, I want to talk today about Revisions and Dissents, which is a series of essays on various historical topics. And with a bit of current events thrown in at the very end, we'll say, but an outstanding book. Paul holds a Ph.D., in history from Yale. We'll try not to hold that against him. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me again. All right, so the book is Revisions and Dissents. I want you, even though it's a variety of topics that's covered, tell me if there's a thread running through these revisions and dissents. Yes, indeed there is a thread, uh, and it is this, that most of the people who are featured as important historians uh, by the American Historical Association, the Uh, Association of Modern Historians, whatever they're called, uh, uh, the ones who are written up in New York Review of Books, the New York Times, etc., a National Review, New Republic, etc., hold very conventional historical views, which seem to be uh, generally uh, shaped by some kind of sheer, uh, some kind of ideological consensus. And I was struck by this many years ago. Uh, actually more than 50 years ago when I was a graduate student at Yale, that um, certain points of view you were not even allowed to express. For example, criticism of Woodrow Wilson and American involvement in World War I, um, or the uniformly negative view of the German, uh, uh, the second German, the German Second Empire um, and the achievement of Bismarck. Um, the uh, uh, the the, the, the views we were allowed to express were the ones that the professor held, and uh, he would. Uh, I, I remember particularly uh, professors in German history would talk about how authoritarian German universities were, and what struck me is I could not imagine a more authoritarian setting than the one that I was in there. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So what I what I what I do in this book is simply revisit certain historical topics, which I think. Um, um, have been treated in a uh, establishmentarian and ideological fashion, um, and try to present alternative points of view, which make at least as much sense to me as the views that were forced down my throat as a graduate student, in which I read in prestigious, uh, uh, highbrow American magazines. All right. Well, in light of that introduction to the book then that means i want to skip ahead to chapter four and then we'll get to some of the other things uh, later but the problem of historical connections right in here now this uh, is a great example of historians who have an ideological axe to grind right who, who wind up weaving these tales that are coming in large part out of their own imaginations mm-hmm. and and that we see beginning in the way late 19th century well the, the way germany is covered period Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm curious about, let's start there, the way Germany, not just in World War II, but also in World War I, I mean, that's really, you know, okay, I mean, I I get that Hitler's a a bad guy, but World War I, the situation is obviously a bit more subtle than that. Right. Uh, And even even before that. So let's let's start with Bismarck. Are they getting Bismarck right? Uh, No. Um, the, uh, The view of Bismarck is generally that he was a precursor of Adolf Hitler, the the Jonathan Steinberg uh, sort of official American biography, uh, you know, uh, uh, presents that view or, de- or, de- or depicts him uh, as somebody who looks toward Kaiser Wilhelm, who looks toward Hitler, um, it, and uh, sort of uh, initiates what, he calls, what they call the German Sonderweg, you know, the peculiar path of Germans to modernity, which results in Hitler. And Bismarck is... Uh, you know, a, a stellar figure uh, in this demonology. Um, and uh, what I try to do is present what seems to me a more balanced picture of him. By the way, you know, it's sort of reached a point 
that uh, now that the Germans are faced with the uh, the anniversary of the 500th anniversary of uh, Luther's uh, Reformation, they don't know what the hell to do with it because Luther has now been reinterpreted as a Nazi or precursor of the Nazis who made anti-Semitic remarks while at dinner, and uh, most people in the Lutheran Church in Germany aren't Christians anymore. Uh, so what they're doing is they're simply discussing all the bad things that Luther said and how he was an anti-Semite, a racist, and a sexist. Um, it, it's, as, it's as if they, they can't even handle things that happened hundreds of years ago. Um, as, as a friend of mine, Robbie Stove, point, I think I, I quote this, that uh, if an American neoconservative or liberal listens to Bach, St. Matthew Passion there, um, they claim to be able to discern the blueprint for Auschwitz or something like that. But, I mean, it's, it's reached a point of absolute hysteria. I mean, it's not become any better. Um, and the, the attempt to look for precursors of Hitler everywhere, not only in Bismarck, but in people who lived a thousand years ago, you know, seems to go on and on. Well, let me say – just can I just say a word about Luther because I've actually read a lot of the things that he said about the Jews and mm -hmm. they are quite blood-curdling. I mean th these That's are true. not just – boy, these Jewish folks, you got to keep an eye on them. I mean, well, you know, some people have said things like that and they they shouldn't say that. But, right. But, th I mean, w this is pretty bad stuff. But that does not mean that therefore he would, you know, w wink at, you know, at, at executing – Jews. So, That's correct. So, yeah. uh, but yet at the same, but, but my point is, I don't want to breeze through this as if we're just talking about a, a few jokes he told on the side. These are horrifying things. No, they are, of course, they are. He horrible. said things about the Pope that are far worse, but that's another matter. Right, right. You're right. He was a very splenetic Christian. <laughs> he made very strong comments about people and things he disagreed with. Uh, but I mean, obviously, this is not the whole of you know the story. Uh, you do not encapsulate the Reformation by quoting remarks that he made about the Pope or the Jews. Uh, but I think that the, Germ the Germans have sort of reached a, a point in this uh, uh, reductionism of everything to Hitler uh, that, you know, uh, they, uh, even great people in their past like Kant or Hegel or Luther, or whoever, they were always looking for things that they said that were politically incorrect. This has reached a point at which, you know, Germans publish dissertations and books on Kant you know, as a racist, because he assumed some kind of racial inequality in his writings in anthropology in the 18th century, as did everybody else, of course. Um, but, you know, they, they go after him, or that Hegel, uh, in his philosophy of history, uh, assigned a lower place in the moral, spiritual order to the Jews than the Christians, shows he was an anti-Semite, which clearly he was not. <laughs> but this goes on and on. I mean, this... this um, this game of blaming your ancestors for not being politically correct and trying to attach to them the stigma of being a precursor of the Nazis. Well, what is the correct way, then, to think about a historical figure like Bismarck? Um, you know, A, that he's a man of his age, B, that he's a great statesman, C, that he does unify the, the German nation. And as I point out, he is certainly not solely responsible for the wars through which German unification is achieved. Uh, one of the things I, I look at is, you know, the question of why is Bismarck, who achieves unification of his country, um, one might say oh, with uh, relatively little bloodshed, why is he worse than Abraham Lincoln, whose war resulted in the death of so over 700,000 Americans and left large sections of the United States devastated? Um, you know, why is Lincoln a greater moral figure than Bismarck? This is something I keep coming back to. And by the way, I'm not a Lincoln hater, uh, but the, the point is if we're going to condemn everybody in the past who engaged in civil war, who fought wa wage wars and so forth as, uh, you know, as proto-Nazis, I suppose one could make the same judgment about, uh, about Lincoln, certainly Woodrow Wilson, who was a racist and got us into World War I. Um, but certain people seem to be exempt from the criticisms that are laid against Bismarck and other figures in German history. Well, let's fast forward to World War I. I had Hunt Tooley on last week, and we right. did talk about the Fisher thesis a little bit. I've probably talked about that with you a long time ago, but not everybody has listened to all 889 episodes of the Tom Wood Show. You may find <laughs> right. that hard to believe. So I, I think it's worth talking about now. Do you think of, of – because there obviously is a kind of Germanophobic – aspect to, well, Western culture, 
these days and, mm-hmm. and has been for a long time, even in Germany itself to, to some degree. and Particularly in Germany itself. <laughs> right, right, right. And no doubt among the historical profession. Do you think of the Fisher thesis, which I'd first of all like you to explain, as being a subset of that? Or is Fisher just a dispassionate scholar who came to a view that was different from yours? He is certainly not a dispassionate scholar. He was a uh, uh, a fairly high-placed Nazi academic official who ratted on his colleagues to the Nazi party during World War II. Uh, uh, they were going to put him up for trial as a war criminal, uh, but then he underwent some kind of conversion to anti-German or Germanophobia. <laughs> and this is clearly reflected in his book, uh, Germany's, uh, das war Deutschland's Griff nach der Weltmacht, Germany's Bid for World Empire, um, what, what he does is give you sort of a, uh, a, ver- a version of uh, Germany's march toward the First World War, which totally ignores all of the countervailing evidence <laughs> that this is not true. And there's mountains of evidence that he ignores that, A, Germany did not plan you know, a general European war to, uh, to create a large empire in Central Europe, uh, B, there were other players who were responsible for the war, uh, and C, uh, the, uh, the war aims expressed by the German Chancellor, Theobald uh, von bethmann holweg in September 1914, uh, were created after the war had begun and were no more outlandish than the war aims that came from England, France, Russia, and other powers. Indeed, England, from the moment it gets into the war, and France, from the time it gets into the war, are committed to the utter destruction of, of Germany. It to- totally, you know, just, just uh, rip the whole thing apart, uh, reduce it to principalities that could be controlled by foreign countries, uh, and have the French take, you know, take over Western Germany and the Russians Eastern Germany. So this goes well beyond what the Germans are calling for. But what Fischer is doing is obviously playing to German war guilt over Hitler and trying to extend the condemnation you know, of Hitler's war of conquest and uh, the, the dominance of Nazi ideology in the Second World War back to the First World War and to the German Second Empire. Uh, as far as I can see, the Fischer thesis should have absolutely no standing um, as a serious historical argument. It was, however, the only view of the First World War that we were allowed to have when I was a graduate student. Uh, which is one of the reasons I decided I wasn't going to write on the subject, uh, because I would have been you know, probably kicked out of graduate school. Certainly my dissertation would have been rejected. But the, uh, the Fisher thesis still seems to have proponents or supporters in certain camps. A, in Germany, it is the only government official interpretation of the war, although there's lots of fine German scholarship that has come out even in the last few years, which clearly refutes, takes apart everything in the Fisher thesis, you know, for the, probably for the 500 or 1,000th time. But, you know, the, 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 another, another group that is constantly pushing the Fisher thesis is the, uh, is the neoconservatives. And there the, the reason is quite clear. They're angry at Auschwitz. They're angry at the Nazis. They hate the Germans and are trying to push back the Nazi phenomenon into an earlier period, to Bismarck, maybe earlier in time, uh, there was a piece in the Weekly Standard, by the way, I think the latest issue of the Weekly Standard, so David Gordon tells me, that, um, that you know, insists that the United States should have entered World War I in 1914 to deal with the German, I don't know, mil- militaristic threat, although the United States was in no way threatened by Germany. <laughs> right. But, Is this Arthur Herman who wrote that? No, Arthur Herman wrote another piece. His was a National Review, but he has the same view, by the way. He's a fish right. Okay, then that's what I was thinking of. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. So we should have and, gotten involved earlier. And, and by the way, oh, go ahead, go ahead. But then I want to ask you about something John McCain said. That I'm sure you're, you, you can be waiting with uh, bated breath uh, for that. He's <laughs> a great hero of mine. Yeah, right. no, the, 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 the other group that seemed to like the Fisher thesis are uh, Thatcherite British historians like Max Hastings, whom I've uh, written a review and they, they don't seem to be influenced by anything else. I mean, they deny the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the evidence of British complicity or at least complicity of, the, uh, of Edward Gray's government, of Churchill, um, in the machinations that lead to the war, making promises, uh, dangerous promises to the French and Russians be, uh, in 1914 and even earlier. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, Hastings, other British historians seem to, and I think Paul Johnson, uh, uh, go on pushing the Fisher, Fisher thesis. Well, ask me your other question. I'm still answering that one at length. Well, it, it actually moves forward to World War II just for a second, only because I was reminded of it by this idea that we should have gotten into World War I earlier. Right. I'm pretty sure John McCain, at one time or another, has said that if the U.S. had intervened at the moment of the remilitarization of the Rhineland, mm -hmm. then that would have been the time to do it, and, and we should have gotten in at that point. Now, that's pretty early on in the history of uh, Hitler's moves in the 30s. How do you react to that? I entirely agree, <laughs> believe it or not. No, I, I, th I think in 1936, uh, there, uh, Hitler would have been overthrown by the German military and people in the diplomatic corps. Um, and, he, you know, he basically calls the bluff of the other side. And uh, it might have been quite possible to get rid of him in 1936, uh, even as late as 1938. And finally, it would have been possible to get rid of the Nazi regime, uh, you know, in 1944, uh, if the United States had cooperated with the German resistance instead of actually turning them in to the Nazis, uh, which was done by Alan Dulles at the time. But th there were various points at which um, the United States, you know, short of bombing half of Europe, you know, could have uh, could have stopped the Nazis. All right. Well, I was not expecting you to say that. I would be interested to hear Pat Buchanan's response. You actually wrote an interesting review of Pat's book on World War II, but I don't want to get too far afield. I want to stick to the – I mean, you're here to talk about this book, and I, I think one of my pet peeves is you go on to talk about your book, and the, the host talks about everything in the world other than your book. We're not doing that. <laughs> right. Talk, talk about right. that some other time. There's a there's a essay in here, Defining Right and Left, mm -hmm. which is a real – passion of mine, especially because I run into a lot of people who are otherwise wonderful, lovely people who say there's no such thing as right and left. And I think right. they're just so um, jaded by the Ron Paul experience. They feel like right and left is all just a sham. Right. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, it's it, the state is, is just monolithic. And to some degree, I mean, it is interesting to watch how respectable right and left close ranks against outsiders, whether it's Buchanan or Jerry Brown. Mm -hmm. I, I get that. I think that's quite interesting. But on the other hand, I think it's going much too far to say there's no such thing as right and left. There absolutely is. History makes no sense unless there's a right and a left. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know what you think. Not, uh, I have no interest in what Jonah Goldberg thinks right and left are. <laughs> but what do you think are the really defining beliefs that make the right what it is and make the left what it is? Yeah, if, if, if you notice, I distinguish between conservatism and the right. The argument that I make is that the left has pretty much won uh, within conventional politics and establishment journalism. Uh, and the left believes in universalism, equality, uh, human rights, the interchangeability of everybody, men, women, whatever. Uh, that, you know, everybody is the same, or everybody can be reconstructed to be the same uh, by a benevolent state. Um, what characterizes the right is that it opposes the left's projects. Uh, there was a classical, there's classical conservatism, uh, which I argue, uh, uh, one might say with increasing futility, uh, is dead. You know, I mean, it, it's uh, someone like Richard Weaver, Russell Kirk, uh, Joseph de Mestre, Edmund Burke expressed classical conservative positions. But they were never particularly strong in the United States. And if we have any kind of conservative tradition, it's probably some kind of fusion of Calvinism and classical liberalism. Um, but we really don't have anything like a European classical conservative tradition. We do have a right. And the, the right opposes the left's project for a number of reasons, one of which is that it does not believe in the efforts of the state to achieve equality thinks that this is a tyrannical uh, um, effort. Uh, the right also believes that people are communal. They're organic. They have organic relations to other people and that the managerial state is a threat to traditional social organic relations. Um, and then fi finally, the right believes in particularity. You know, it wishes to defend communities, uh, nations where, where they exist, um, it rejects the idea of the universal state, to quote uh, Leo Strauss. This is one of the few times he was right. <laughs> uh, so in all these respects, we have the right. You know, I've been encountering the same argument that you've been complaining against uh, among French, uh, 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 conservative Frenchmen uh, or nationalists who keep telling me 
that they're no longer right and left in France. There's just the working class and the international estate lead or something like that. Well, the working class in France is on the right because it opposes the universal state. It is fighting for traditional community. You and I may not like its economic programs, but you know what drives it is you know the is the rightist impulse. So I, I would agree with you. I think right and left are very much alive. I mean the terms are very relevant, even if most of the political establishment throughout the Western world, including the neoconservatives, particularly the neoconservatives, belong to the left. I know some people may think this is just nitpicking to be concerned about uh, uh, labels like this, but I don't think it is. I think this I really gets to the heart of what, what differentiates people. So I, I want to pick up on this in just a minute after we thank our sponsor. Folks, if you're a regular listener of this show, you know what I got one of my favorite guests, Michael Malice, for a gift when I was floundering around thinking what I could get for him. I got him a great shave set from Harry's because I've had such great experiences with it. I thought, why should I have all the fun of an awesome shave and looking great and feeling great? Let's let Michael Malice have some happiness in his life. So I gave him that gift, and Harry's wants to give you a gift. They want to give you their trial set for free for just three smackers to cover the shipping. It's a 13-smacker value. It's the razor handle, five precision-engineered blades with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade, a rich lathering shave gel, and a travel blade cover for nothing. Just three smackers for shipping. You get this beautiful set. And if you don't think this is the most awesome shave you ever had, well, I owe you a Coke. Check it out at harrys.com slash woods. That's a $13 value for free. Just cover shipping at harrys.com slash woods. All right, I have to bring this up because it's a libertarian show with a libertarian audience right. with some conservatives thrown in. And in there, you make the claim that I totally get that libertarianism is a product of the left. And I suppose right. in the broad historical sweep of things, mm -hmm. there's probably no denying that. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if they're against an established religion, well, th that's not rightist. Uh, they, by and large, were against the monarchies of their day. Well, there's nothing rightist about that. Mm -hmm. They wanted freedom of speech and freedom of thought. I mean, that is radical. I'll, I'll give you that. Okay. Yes. But at the same time, I think you hit on something that could, at least in today's context, clearly place libertarianism, at least some brands of it, in the rightist camp, which mm -hmm. would be, I believe in organic communities, I believe in particularity, I believe in tradition, and I it's precisely because I believe that the state as it exists now and it is as it is ever likely to exist as long as you or I live or can conceive of is always and everywhere going to be an enemy of that, that I'm anti-state. It's not, you know, not, not because I necessarily at, you know, at two in the morning want to, you know, make bird noises on my roof uh, standing <laughs> right. on one leg. It's because of these rooted and th these traditional reasons mm -hmm. that I'm against the state. So do I qualify? Absolutely you do. As a matter of fact, you have restated my argument with greater eloquence and precision than I do, than I do in my book. <laughs> or my book on fascism, in which I, you know, I think I, I end up putting Ron Paul and, I don't know, the Falange in the same, or say that, you know, objectively they're both on the right uh, because they oppose the left. And, uh, you know, and that, and that I, I, I'm always bringing, using that classical Marxist term that objectively here's where you stand you know, no matter what you say, that, you know, oh, I, I, I remember the, uh, the late Ralph Rako, he liked uh, Frédéric Bastiat and would always, you know, who was a radical leftist in his time. Uh, but most of the things Ralph said to me sounded very, very right wing. Uh, the same with Murray Rothbard. So, you know, I, I, I think that many libertarians, particularly we call paleo libertarians, um, are driven to libertarian positions partly by their reactionary social views. Or at least the reactionary social views are compatible with their libertarian. Yeah, right, ideas. right, right. I can, I can definitely see that. I'm, mm -hmm. I want to move on to your chapter, and I'm going to let you describe this. You have a chapter called "Liberal Democracy as a God Term." Right. I'm just going to let you talk about that. <laughs> you're letting, you're letting me grind my axe again. Uh, That's yeah, what this no, show I, is here for, Paul. <laughs> right. You know the. Uh, uh, I was telling, actually, I had a conversation with David Gordon about this yesterday, and he liked the essay on liberal democracy, and I told him I did not make up the statement at the beginning of that essay that when a Straussian uh, superior of mine at Rockford College about 45 years ago uh, said that we have to oppose the Soviets 
because we are defending liberal democracy. I thought he meant something like George McGovern or Hubert Humphrey. I never had heard that term before. Now liberal democracy is like the official credo of the official conservative movement. And uh, as far as I can tell, it means something like... uh, you know, an American welfare state that engages in moderate social engineering and unleashes wars for human rights or something like that, um, and which has periodic elections to endorse what the governing class do. Right? I think that's, that's what liberal democracy probably means. Uh, because it, it, is, it is not democracy in the sense that I can understand it, nor is it liberalism, which if you read my book, After Liberalism, uh, is, uh, you know, I land up defining a, something like 19th century bourgeois liberalism. It's neither. Um, it is not even a melange. Uh, I think it's an entirely new creation, and I think it is a justification for a particular regime, which is the United States as it has evolved since the New Deal, or particularly since the 1960s, um, and is usually tied to the project of bringing a government similar to ours, if not entirely identical, uh, to benighted people everywhere in the world, um, as you know, the neoconservatives John McCain and Lindsey Graham uh, all you know would, would would call for doing. So I, you know, I don't, I don't say. And what 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 also strikes me is the word liberal democracy hardly ever appears in American historical political discussions uh, beyond post World War II period. I, I think I think it first gets used dur- during the Second World War and the struggle against fascism. Uh, and then, you know, sort of picked up by uh, Hubert Humphrey, Cold War liberals, and then uh, recycled again by the neoconservatives. And now this is one of these terms, though, that's easy for somebody like Paul Godfrey to say, liberal democracy, and, you know, what a crummy idea. But then somebody <laughs> might, might legitimately want to say, well, Paul Godfrey, if you had your druthers, what would replace it? At, at this point in time, it's very, you know, it's, it's hard to do anything other than, you know, agree with Ron Paul and uh, Tom Woods and say, you know, we really have to uh, cut back the scale of government, get rid of the deep state, um, and stop using these stupid ideological labels for everything. You know, the United States was created as a constitutional republic. Um, I sort of like to get back to that idea as much as we can in the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, have a modest foreign policy, one that does not aim at engaging in crusades, democratic crusades, and other societies that have no interest in adopting the present American form of government. Okay. So, you know, it's, I, I'm, I, I sort of want to push back against what we have. I really cannot, say, you know, I, my, my ideal might be the early American republic, but we're not going to go back to that at this point. No, that's right. Many I, things have changed. That's right. That's right. I, I remember Rothbard willing to compromise and saying, I will go <laughs> back to the federal budget under George Washington. All right. Just that's to pretty, show I'm not good. an extremist. <laughs> right. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Um, there's a there's a lot of European history that's covered in here, of course, because mm-hmm. that's uh, really where you've done a lot of your work. And I wonder, as I'm looking it over, because I actually read this quite some time, maybe maybe a, not a year, but many months ago, let's say I right. read the original manuscript. Um, so, and I actually recommended at the time that there be a Trump chapter added because it seemed so. Oh, relevant. you were the to, one. Who yeah, I'm you sorry. Write that. <laughs> yeah, now it comes out that I was the anonymous guy who recommended right. that. So we'll have to say something about that in just a minute. But but give me one of these. Uh, I mean, you, I don't know. You probably don't remember the chapter names off, offhand. But give me a European, like a modern European topic that that we need to hit where uh, everybody's all wrong. I guess that would be pretty much anything. But well, you know, you know, there was one. There was one review I wrote of the uh, this book by by Kurtzer on Pius XI and Mussolini. And oh, I have right. to say, yes. I was never outraged by any stupid book as much as I was <laughs> by that one. <laughs> and he won prizes. And he, they, the Italian Senate had to listen to this junk, which he probably delivered in Brooklynese English or something. But uh, it's a horrible book. And, you know, I was just, I was just sitting there reading this, this, this thing. And, uh, you know, it was like every leftist cliche, uh, uh, ac- you know, misplaced accusations of anti-Semitism. It was, and then the New York Review of Books, you know, devoted, uh, I don't know, an issue or half an issue to this work. Um, I, I enjoyed writing that review and just taking the book apart. <laughs> All right. Well, that, yeah, that, that is actually a very satisfying chapter in here, I, I, will, <laughs> right. I, I will concede. 
let's let's say something about the were you by the way were you really not going to put a trump chapter in there um i was not because i thought it was a little bit too contemporary uh but then when my uh, the acquisition editor amy ferranto pushed me a bit uh, you know, I finally did it, and she, I, I'd written these essays on Trump uh, for, I think, Front Page or so, maybe Rockwell, and she wanted me to write one. She said, and one of the readers insisted that you, <laughs> that you had this, right. so I just went ahead and, and did it. So, yeah, so, I mean, of course, it's it's not customary to admit that I was a reader for this, but I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> it's okay. And, and I, and I, because I, I thought that the book was was going so for the jugular with stuff like the the end of history and now that we have oh, yeah. liberal democracy <laughs> and open borders and all right, you know right. and that this is the norm and everybody's happy about it and globalism mm-hmm. and interconnectedness when clearly there's this mass movement around the world of people who rightly or wrongly are not in favor of it and right, do not right. believe that history is all over <laughs> then mm-hmm. therefore Trump has to be commented on as somebody who is in some way contradicting this but yet Trump as I have said till I'm blue in the face is such a frustratingly unsystematic thinker. It's like he doesn't even see... It's almost like he's not reading your books, Paul, but it's like he doesn't see where he stands in all this. I think he thinks he's a guy who wants to fix the trade issue and try and build a wall, and, and you know, that's... It's not like he doesn't even get what his historical significance would be if he were aware of it. I, th- I think you're right, and, if, you know, he just... He seems to be drifting into the neoconservative camp with Kushner... And, uh, you know, trying to bring on board people like Lindsey Graham and Syria and so forth. Um, I don't think he even understands his own base very well, uh, or at least at least not the intellectual wing of his base, uh, which, you know, seems to be coming out of the old right or paleo-libertarians or uh, some camp he does not understand at all. But you're right, I think he has a very limited agenda, and uh, I, I think much of his... Uh, world view was shaped by the society in which he has lived in the last 70 years. Uh, and I doubt it was our society, you know, in which he lived. Uh, so, you know, it, uh, it doesn't surprise me that people say he's sort of like, you know, moving back in the direction of the neoconservatives. Uh, since I don't think, I agree with you, I don't think there's very firm uh, ideas or any kind of firm ideological commitment other than building a wall and dealing with trade issues and possibly rebuilding the American military. But when he was friendly with Farage over in Britain, I thought, okay, maybe he sees a connection between himself and 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 those people, and and the fact that he cheered on Brexit. Yeah. I thought meant okay, maybe he kind of does get who he is. Right. Mm-hmm. And and I'm glad I just got done saying. I've said this now several times on the show. But one thing that makes me happy is that. Although there are some people who will follow him no matter what he does, and there are people who will follow him only when he does stupid things, Mm -hmm. he has supporters who are willing to come out and say, you know, I'm really, really concerned about the direction he's moving in. Yes, he does. I didn't Mm -hmm. see that from – I mean, yeah, I know there are leftists like at Counterpunch who didn't like Obama that much. But I'm talking about the general run of his supporters. I mean, my Facebook feed, I have some people on my Facebook feed who supported Trump, and it is flooded with people saying this is an outrage that he now he wants to intervene in the Middle East even more than we thought he might. And right, I, I, right. Whereas I did not see that under Obama. They just ignored his foreign policy or they made excuses for it. So that, that I think, goes to show that our side, such as it is, is better than their side. I'm just going to come right out and say it. Our side's better. No, I, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, or at least those in our side who think – uh, I, 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 <laughs> that, I think there's a great vanishingly unwashed. small number, unfortunately. Uh, right, right. The, the great unwashed who supported Trump, like no matter what he did. You know, where I live, we have you know, lots of deplorables and real deplorables, not like us. We're just symbolic deplorables. Right. But the real deplorables, you know, like anything he does, you know, he bombed the hell out of those people and said, it's fine. You know, yeah. if he decides he doesn't want to do it, that's okay too. So I, you know, I, I think he does have maybe thirty to thirty-five percent core support which will go with him anywhere that he goes. Uh, they just like him. They like his style. And see, like that, 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 goes to show, well, well, that goes to show what a missed opportunity he is because he has this unprecedented connection with I people. Mm-hmm. He could stand up to them and say, you know, you, we've all been had by these people. Man, did they mm-hmm. get us into a quagmire. Why don't we rebuild our own country? They'd cheer for that. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the thing that I, that I am concerned about it almost seems as if he did what he did with the Tomahawk missiles because he was trying to improve his popularity in the United States and trying to neutralize opposition. 
which is relentless, which was relentless until he uh, unleashed those tomahawks. Now, he, you know, people say nice things about him on CNN. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, Bill Crystal said, you know, at last he's my president. And I heard Jeremy, Jamie Kerchick. Uh, oh, no, uh, don't Fox, tell me. No, he if was, anything, he was he's praising, worse. He was praising, <laughs> praising Trump, <laughs> but also pointing out Trump should also now send, like, you know, uh, umpteen thousand people into the Middle East to fight away, you know, to fight against uh, against Assad, you know. But uh, and this is unfortunately this is only the first step. Now they want more. Uh, they're not going to be satisfied until there's, until they there's, have, like, there's half the American population. Yeah, and until an Islamic government is is installed in Syria, then then right. they'll scratch their heads and pretend they had no idea this was going to happen, and then mm-hmm. it'll start mm-hmm. all over again. Yeah. Uh, all right. Look. Well, wait, oh, no. Go ahead. No, I was, I was just, uh, uh, I was just pointing out that uh, uh, he, uh, Trump may even be prevented by the media and even by people like Tillerson uh, and Nikki Haley, uh, who scares me, <laughs> uh, from uh, making any kind of deal with Putin. I mean, the Russians do have vital interest in Syria. They have ports there. They're not going to give them up. Um, if you want to, even if you want to get rid of Assad, you're going to have to work out some kind of agreement with the Russians. Uh, but they. Uh, uh, the the neoconservatives and uh, the warmongers uh, who are rallying to Trump don't want that. Uh, they want a confrontation with Russia as well. In fact, they see they see the Syrian engagement, you know, as the first step to uh, having a more serious confrontation with Russia. Yeah, yeah. This is why the whole thing. The left had nothing to worry about. It turns out they were so terrified <laughs> at the prospect of peace with Russia. Right. Don't worry, people. <laughs> No worries about that. You got your wish on that. Uh, and, and it goes to show I coined a, a new law, Woods's Law. This is my fourth. I've I come up with them once in a while. And Woods's Law is no matter whom you vote for, you always wind up with John McCain. And I, you know, I mean, I mean, it doesn't pre- thought. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it doesn't precisely sum up America, but it's close. <laughs> yes. it's, it's close. All right. The book is Revisions and Dissents. Uh, they're uh, tremendous essays by Paul Gottfried. You will learn an enormous amount. I'm linking to it on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 889. And uh, Paul, this is great fun. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for having me again. Okay. I have two things I have to tell you. Number one, there won't be any episodes tomorrow that is thursday or friday of this week leading into easter so we will be raring to go starting next week we will be doing an episode of contra krugman as usual this week and that's going to be an interesting one because it does deal with the syria issue we're going to bring on a special guest not scott horton this time because i just talked to scott on this show but a guest who's never been on contra krugman before so if you're not listening to my sister podcast which i produce with bob murphy once a week called contra krugman you can find that at ContraKrugman.com. Second thing is, wow, is this a great website from a listener of the show. It's called The Nomadic Professor, and you'll find it at NomadicProfessor.com. No the in the URL. It's just NomadicProfessor.com. And he says to me, in a nutshell, I'm a history professor who now teaches completely online giving me the mobility required to create on-location mini-lectures around the world. Right now, my wife, four kids, and I are on a two-year shoestring budget world trip, creating nomadic professor content all along the way. We'll hit six continents in the process, maybe all seven. Eventually, I'll roll out full history courses, too, supplemented by on-location lectures. From time to time, my libertarianism bleeds through my videos, but I try to keep it subtle. Clearly, I'm no professional, but the videos get better and better, so I'm excited about the future. In the meantime, we are true nomads. He says, the best thing people can do for me if they like my stuff, subscribe to my YouTube channel and or become my patron on Patreon. So you'll find links for that at nomadicprofessor.com. Boy, that looks great. That's a brilliant idea. Great. Nomadicprofessor.com will be linked at tomwoods.com slash 889, as the listener website mentioned. And, of course, I'll be linking to Paul Gottfried's book that we talked about today, Revisions and Dissents. All right, that is it. It is radio silence from the Tom Woods Show from now until uh, through the weekend. So I'll see you next week. You can always, um, you know, do something productive, spiritually or otherwise, over the next few days. I have produced almost 900 episodes that should always keep a person busy during any Tom Woods downtime. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. See you next week. 
Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.